Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I'll introduce myself first for those of you who don't know me. I'm Carol Harlow from Thayer School Development Office. And I guess I'm responsible for William and Brian's being here today. I was on a trip raising funds for Thayer a couple of weeks ago and saw William on Good Morning America. And I said, it sounds to me, said to myself, it sounds to me like these people ought to come visit Dartmouth and Thayer School because William not only is on a book tour of America, but he is also looking at colleges where he can come next year and major in engineering. So I Googled, <laughs> I Googled and found out how to send an email to him and I sent one and then about two hours later I got a call from uh, people that are traveling with him and said, yeah, we think we'll come. So. Here he is. <laughs> um, I want to introduce next uh, the person who is the president of our Humanitarian Engineering Leadership Program, Nick Edwards. And for those of you that don't know about HELP, it's a uh, wonderful student-led organization based here at Thayer that does engineering projects in developing countries and their work is rapidly evolving from being just doing something that some group says well maybe it would be good to do this to actually um, teaching and turning over the technology that they um, uh, develop so that it can be expanded and spread in the countries where the group is working. Um, so. I won't say any more about that, but I will introduce Nick. It's Nick Edwards, who's the president of HELP, and they've done a lot of the work on uh, pulling this all together today. Thanks, Carol. Um, so I have the privilege of introducing our two very special guests today. Uh, we have William Komkwamba here, um, who has a pretty incredible story that he'll be sharing with you. William single-handedly brought electricity to his village in Malawi by uh, constructing a windmill using only local materials and borrowed textbooks. Um, it's a pretty cool story. And uh, he is currently a senior at the African Leadership Academy, which is a, a pan-African high school in Johannesburg, South Africa. And uh, accompanying William is Brian Mueller. Brian is the author of All Things Must Fight to Live, Stories of War and Deliverance in the Congo, which is, uh, it, it, uh, it's about his uh, experience covering the, the war in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, Brian was also a former Associated Press staff correspondent, and his work has appeared in several magazines uh, including Harper's and Esquire. And their book is on sale right now, just outside. We don't have that many copies, so uh, if you'd like to get one, you should go up and grab one before they sell out. But with that, I'm going to give the floor to our very special guests, William and Brian. Oh, you want to? Oh, oh, I'll, go. Oh, I'll go this side. Wait, can you see? No, you go this side. I'll go this side. <laughs> We've done this like a thousand times, but I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Brian Mueller. This is my esteemed colleague, Windmill Bill. And we are on a, a whirlwind tour of the country. And uh, as uh, Carol said, um, looking at, we're doing, you know, book events, but also looking at colleges. And so, um, we're happy to be here, and um, we'll get started. And you know what we do is a, uh, it's like a slideshow, it's about 20 minutes, and then 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll have a little short clip of a forthcoming documentary that's being made about William, um, and should be released in 2011. Um, so, you know, you'll get to see in action some of the stuff we're talking about. So, um, shall we? Yes, we shall. All right. Here so. we go. Um, as Brian has already said, I'm William Kankwamba. I'm from Malawi. Uh, Malawi is in South East Africa, bordered by 
uh, Mozambique, Tanzania, and Zambia. Geographically, that's where Malawi is. Um, this is the view of the village where I came from, Wimbe. This is how it looked like. Uh, this picture was taken bes beside my, my house. Uh, this is my father standing in the front of the house. Uh, this is me when I was a boy with my father. My father used to tell me that during those times there wasn't a colored camera, but I guess he was just joking. <laughs> so this is me with my parents, my mom and my dad. Um, I grown up in the family of seven children, um, all sisters excepting me. <laughs> you can imagine the troubles I went through. <laughs> at school, always, when I was at primary school, always the bullies speak on me. They say that you don't have an older brother to protect you. They were just beating me. But anyway, I survived from them. Uh, Malawi is an uh, agricultural country. Most 80% um, of Malawi, they are subsistence farmers, we depend on farming. Uh, we grew maize, uh, tobacco, um, soya beans, and potatoes. Uh, this is our everyday activities, it's um, uh, farming. So we grew maize, which we made our main, main food. We call it Nsima. We, we grow it for, for food. So Nsima, we made Nsima to, to, to make our uh, food using the flour from the maize. Uh, we eat sima with together with the vegetables and sometimes fish as well. Um, Wait, how long has it been since you've had sima? Your mother's sima? Uh, I think f three months now, I think. It's too long, huh? Yeah, man. I've really missed it. It's torture every day we do this too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in the good years, when we are planting um, maize, we can harvest up to um, 15 to 20 bucks in the good years. This is how the corn, corn, maize, uh, corn cab look like. It's like um, looking a little happy that these are good years. But it's not always like every year that things turn like that. Every, every time things turn um, in to be good, harvest enough maize. Sometimes uh, there are a couple of things that can change things. Uh, things like um, weather. Uh, if the rain didn't come quite well, then that particular year, the amount of uh, maize that you can harvest can be reduced. Also, sometimes the price of um, seeds, if you didn't buy proper seeds, if the seeds goes, the price goes up and you just planted any local seeds, and then it can also change the amount of um, maize that you can harvest in a particular year. Also, the price of the fertilizer also affect the farmers in the uh, rural areas. Yeah, as William said, most people in Malawi are sustenance farmers. They grow about an acre to an acre and a half of maize, and that's the food that they eat all year round. And then uh, they, very few of them grow anything else. Um, uh, they'll have, uh, if you're lucky, maybe you have some extra cash, you buy some tobacco seed and some fertilizer, and you can sell tobacco as a cash crop and use that money to um, send your kids to the doctor or buy shoes or clothing. Um, but not a lot of people are that, are that fortunate. Um, and when you only grow to eat and never for profit, it's a very precarious way to live. And um, any kind of hit, Jesse mentioned, in, in the rain or if there's a, you know, droughts or the government decides to increase the price of the subsidized fertilizer or the seeds, you can really push I mean, millions of people over the edge into, into hunger, and that's exactly what happened in the year 2000. Malawi experienced a horrible drought, and you know, followed by floods, actually, and then more drought. And um, normally in a good year, as William, you know, you saw the big uh, harvest of maize behind him, you'll get about 20 bags, these big 20 bags uh, of, of grain that they'll, it'll stack to the ceiling in a storage room and spill out into the hallway, and that'll sustain them all year. But uh, this particular year, uh, his family only harvested about three bags, and it was much, much worse in the countryside. Williams uh, area really experienced the, the most rain in that area, actually. And so they were able to harvest about three bags, so you can imagine the food's going to run out pretty quick. Um, normally when this happens, the government 
will come and they'll uh, they'll have a, an emergency it's a, a an emergency grain ration uh, grain reserves and they'll put that on the market in these in diff various villages and people can afford to get some food until they can harvest their next crop well this particular year um, the government was working with the IMF and the World Bank to pay down its national debt and someone suggested that they sell off some of this strategic grain reserve and because it was costing too much money to maintain. Well, ps some corrupt officials in the government uh, sold off all of it and so and kept the profit. And so but when all the food ran out around the country, there was no rescue and quite quickly a famine uh, fell acro across the country. Um, why don't you talk about what happened here? I mean, it's in our in our reporting of this book, um, we spent probably most of the time focusing on this famine and the devastating effects it had on Malawi. In the end, um, you know, it lasted almost a year, and in the end, 10,000 people would be dead uh, around the country. And and your family was really locked in the middle of this, William. So why don't you talk about uh, what it was like? I mean, you, you go outside in the morning, uh, and you see your family members and your neighbors d digging in the ground for roots and... Um, and and uh, banana peels, and they're putting you know anything to put inside their stomachs. I mean, the food is just running terribly low. What did your family do, and and describe how you guys made it through? Yeah. So during that time, it was a uh, hard time uh, for everyone in my area. Um, when I woke up every morning, I would see people uh, coming by looking for a piece of work. Uh, people are asking, if you have any work that I can do for you, I can do it. But the payment, instead of money or anything else, just cook me any kind of food. I can be able to, to, to work for you. So it was a really hard time. Uh, also, my family was also very affected of the situation. Uh, instead of being eating um, three meals per day, we started eating uh, only one meal per day, only at night. So that the amount of meat that we had should sustain us up until our next harvesting season. Uh, but because it, was, it, was, it wasn't enough to sustain us until our next harvesting season, the other thing that my parents did, they uh, suggested to, to start a business. So when we remained with the, um, half a bag of maize, uh, my parents said that we are going to start a business uh, so what they did, they grinded the remaining maize and then uh, my mom started making uh, cakes and she was selling cakes at the market and then the profit that she was getting, she was buying more flour and then we are, we are living on the profit that she, she was making the business and then, uh, but because the price of the, price of the maize at the market was going up all the time, it reduces the amount of, um, the the profit that she was making wasn't enough uh, to buy enough flour so that we can be eating enough enough food. It reduces the food that she was bringing at every day at the uh, at night. So it was really a difficult time. Yeah, there was food in the market, but it was being imported from Tanzania, and it was like it was like buying you know a, a Mercedes Benz or something. I mean, it was so completely out of reach for everybody. And so, uh, as he said, you know, his his dad made a, a a crazy decision. They had one half bag of maize left one day. Uh, people are starving all around them, and he made the ultimate gamble. He said, "Well, what we're going to do is we're going to sell this." And so he t told his wife to go and grind it into flour. They took half that food, half that flour. They ate their one meal per day that night, and the rest she made into these cakes. Well, people could afford the cakes. They didn't have enough money to afford the, the maize, but they could afford these cakes, so the cakes went quite quickly. And so with the money she made off these cakes, she would buy another pail of maize, divide it. One half would go to the food that night, and the other half would be more cakes. And the, and the, and the profit was that they got to live, essentially. And... Um, People started eating the, the chaff off the maize. You know, usually they, they shuck the chaff, it's like the clear coat of the maize, and uh, feed it to their pigs and, and goats. When people started eating this, and when that ran out, ran out, the traders started mixing it with sawdust. And so people were actually spending all of their money, um, and they were buying what they thought was chaff, but it was sawdust, and it was making them sick. And when that ran out, people just began to starve to death. And William's family had this one meal per day, um, 
but they're losing weight so drastically. His father, you saw in these pictures, was a huge man. He was a big, giant, strong guy, and his weight would just drop, and he became so obsessed with it that he would, he would wake up in the morning and he would hang himself from his tobacco scale, and he would look at, he would just kind of remark at the way that the needle would go down and down. And uh, it, it got so bad, you know, William, it turned out that his father was actually skipping his meals so his sisters, so William's sisters and himself could eat, and uh, at one point actually lost his vision. He couldn't even see because he was starving to death. Um, and William's mother also during this time, remarkably, uh, gave birth to a baby girl. And on, everybody was worried that the kid wouldn't live. Um, she was eating, you know, these three mouthfuls of food, not even a whole meal, three mouthfuls of food, and told me at night when she would nurse this baby, her hands would tremble so much that she could hardly hold it. And, you know, uh, the baby lived. The baby, you know, is a, she's a vibrant eight-year-old kid now. But, I mean, I mean, William, this was, these were horrible times. I mean, and for a 13-year-old boy as yourself, I mean, it was completely traumatizing, I'm sure. And um, to see all this happen. And, but in the middle of all of this, uh, as if the famine itself wasn't enough, uh, you had another big setback. So why don't you just explain about school? Yeah, so in Malawi, uh, high schools, you have to pay for school fees. Uh, because of the hunger, my parents didn't have any money to send me to school. It was the same year when I was supposed to start uh, my first year of uh, secondary school. And because of that, I was forced to drop out of school. When I had to drop out of school, I looked at my father and looking those dry fuel. It was the future. I couldn't accept. So in order to continue with my studies, I decided that um, I decided to start going to the library. What I was hoping uh, to go to the library, I was hoping that when the hangout would be over, my parents will find money and they will send me back to school. When they will send me back to school, I will be in the same page with my friend who are going to school by that time. Uh, but at the library, I was mostly interested in reading um, science books, uh, physics books. Um, even though uh, when I was reading those uh, science books, even though I couldn't read English that well, most of the time I was using the diagrams and pictures and then learning the words around them um, and learning how electromagnetics works, uh, things like that. Well, let's go into this a little bit deeper. I mean, so you went to this library and you were, you know, you essentially went to go catch up with his pals to read his coursework. You know, at that time, um, most of your friends had already dropped out as well, and there was only a few students left, and so maybe you were hoping that you could be, you could be caught up. Um, and, and so William, you know, he, he, he's a humble guy, he's, uh, but he, didn't really, he couldn't really speak English hardly at all at this point. And so he would see these diagrams and um, didn't really know what they would say, but, he, but he, could, he could figure out the symbols of them, you know, like symbol for switch and, the, and you know, positive and negative and, and uh, you know, direction of current and... It was as if there was a spot in his kind of head already reserved for these places. And um, so if a, a diagram said figure 10, uh, he would look uh, at this diagram and he'd look in the text. And this was a pretty, that, that, that Explaining Physics book is a, is a British textbook. It's really a high school book, so it was already above his level. And so he would find where it says figure 10 in the text and using a dictionary and his librarian, he would basically learn the words around them and, and that way was able to teach himself uh, basic physics. He would, he would teach himself the English around the diagrams and, and, and would do this. And um, one, of the, one of the diagrams, William, was of a bicycle dynamo. And if you guys, I mean, engineering students know what a bicycle dynamo is, it's, it's a basically a bicycle generator, it hooks on the back of a bicycle wheel and through the spinning motion of the tire uh, powers the headlamp. And so, because in Malawi, two to four percent of the people have electricity, so there's no street lights, and there are not a lot of cars, and so uh, to get around, you need to ride a bicycle, and if at night, you need a light. So, uh, dynamos are pretty popular, and uh, as a kid, William would, would, you know, walk around his village, and he would see these, these people on these bicycles with these dynamos, and he would ask them, you know, so how does that make the light work? And they said, well, the light works when I pedal the bicycle. And he goes, no, I, I, but how does it work? And they're like, I, I don't know. I mean, who cares? You know, like, ask your dad or something. And, but his dad didn't know. And, and so, uh, you know, William and his, and his buddy, his pal, uh, Gilbert, and his cousin, Jeffrey, they would get these, these bikes, and they would flip them upside down, and they would spin the pedals, and they would watch that light just flicker on and off. And one day, they figured out they could actually take the wires out of the light itself, and they felt them, and they felt a shock. And it was like, oh, it was kind of a revelation. And so um, 
What, what did you do then, William? You, you guys figured out that you could, you could power a radio, so tell that story. Yeah, uh, so when uh, we discovered that uh, the Dunham um, uh, generates uh, some sort of power, we decided to connect the, uh, the wires from the dynamo to a radio. When we connected, and the, in me, I started uh, paddling the, uh, the bicycle, and then when the bicycle started spinning, and then suddenly the, the radio started playing, uh, playing some music. There was good music, and the, uh, my cousin started dancing. I was like, <laughs> he started dancing. I say, can you, um, can you come and paddle so that I can also dance the music? <laughs> he, he refused, he said that this is my, um, my favorite music, so <laughs> keep paddling. So for me, I get, at the end, I get tired. I was like, ah, what exactly can I do to, uh, what kind of thing can I use to, to paddle the bike so that I can also be enjoying the music? <laughs> so um, um, when I, 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 I continue going to the library, I found the, the book that had um, a picture of the windmill on the cover. And they said that windmill could pump water and generate electricity. So at first, uh, pump water, for me, it meant uh, irrigation for a second crop. I said, if I can build this windmill, I can be able to... Uh, uh, to, to start um, irrigation and my family can be able to grow uh, two to three times a year and then we no longer go this uh, go hungry again uh, I can solve this problem we are facing by building uh, by building one of the windmill uh, but because I didn't have any money to buy uh, materials to build my windmill so what I did I went to a junkyard to look for my uh, materials at the junkyard I I found uh, uh, pieces like um, uh, tractor fan, which I used as a, uh, a lot of the windmill. I also find a, a, a shock absorber, which I use as a shaft of the windmill, uh, using an uh, wood bicycle frame as the frame of the windmill. I was able to, um, uh, to make, uh, for the blades of the windmill, I used the PVC pipes, which I cut them and melting them all the fire to make the blades of the windmill. When I was doing all these things, uh, lots of people, including my mom, uh, thought that I'm going crazy. <laughs> uh, they are saying that I'm smoking marijuana too much. <laughs> but after uh, after some uh, after some time, I was able to uh, I was able to make my my windmill. Yeah. Well, so you start collecting these pieces, but, but the revelation came when you know you're talking about the dynamo. One of the first diagrams that he saw in that in one of these books was of a dynamo. And, he, and, and, and you and your cousin used to play with pinwheels, and, and you figured out that the windmill in the books, they use spinning motion to create electricity, just like the dynamo uses spinning motion. And so you put these things together, you go out and you start, you know, you start looking for these pieces. And you know this scrapyard is right across the road from his secondary school, where his, some of his friends are still going. And so it was really embarrassing for him because you know, he, would, he was already ashamed that he had to drop out of school. And then, you know, but, but he said, you know, if, I, you know, if people were going hungry and you know, they were making fun of him, they are saying, why, don't, why, don't, why are you collecting this stuff? You know, you're, people are starving to death. Why don't you help your mom go look for food? Go help your dad in the fields. Like, do something productive, you know. But William had this forward, uh, you know, vision that, you know, I am going to help my family, but I'm going to help them for good. You know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help them permanently. And... Um, so, William, you know, you, you, you're collecting this scrap metal, and, and people are seeing you from the windows of the school, and they're saying, oh, there's William again, you know, collecting garbage. And, yes, uh, just turn off his, uh, uh, turn off his uh, marijuana cigarette. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you're in there smoking weed. And, um, and, but you kept going, and, you, and, you, and, and you, you know, your, his mom was even worried. His mom even said to his dad one night, you know, I fear this boy is never going to find a husband the way he drags his garbage home all the time. And your room has, had actually turned into a scrapyard itself. And, um, but you kept going. And, you know, you, you had your tractor fan, you know, for your rotor. You had the shock absorber for the shafts. Um, you, you know, you had all these, you know, the, you had all the pieces, but you didn't have a generator. That was the one last piece you didn't have. And so... Um, uh, you, you know, he would see these bicycle dynamos constantly, and you know they would they would go by, but he didn't have any money for them, and and it was like torture. You know, he would see them, and and he'd be like, God, why don't, why don't they just give me one of these things? I could I could really you know use it. I could show them how to use it, and um, so several months pass, 
and, and and he's walking with his friend Gilbert, and they're walking down the street, and and Gilbert says, "Hey, William, you know how's how's the windmill going?" And William says, "Oh, it's not good, man. You know, I, I got all my materials, but I still don't have a dynamo. I still don't have my generator. I I fear it'll never get fixed." And just that moment, someone came pushing a, a bicycle, and on, and on the wheel there was this shiny little metal bottle-looking thing, and and. Uh, and William says, ah, oh, there's like another dynamo, you know, just like more torture. But instead of letting it go, uh, Gilbert ran toward the guy. Gilbert's dad was the chief of all Wimbe district and uh, had a little cash. And so he ran toward the guy and he pulled out 200 quacha notes, and which is like a dollar fifty. And he said, you know, how much of that dynamo? I'm going to buy that thing. And it was a famine and people were starving and the, nobody in their right mind was going to turn down money. And so the guy said, yeah, okay, sure. So, you know, there, he unscrewed the dynamo from the bike and got the lamp and everything. And there was that moment, it was like one of my favorite in the book, it, they, they hand you that dynamo and you feel the weight of it in your hand and it's your last piece and you've come all this, this way. And so how did that make you feel? And, and what did you do? Yeah, so when I received the dynamo, I was very happy because I know that now I'll be able to uh, finish my project. I was afraid that if I'm not going to find the dynamo, I'm not going to finish my project, and the people are saying that uh, I'm going crazy. They will really prove me that I'm real, I'm really crazy because I didn't finish my project. So once I see the dynamo, uh, suddenly I started like I was very happy. I start, I take, I took it, and then I start running towards my house so that I can connect the dynamo to the windmill. And when I was doing all this thing, a lot of people uh, see me that I'm I'm running, and then uh, when I reached home, and then I was. Uh, climbing up the tower and then uh, lots of people see me and they were like they were start coming to see exactly what I was what what I was doing I say uh, let's see how real crazy this boy is and then um, when I climbed up at the top of the my windmill and then I attached my my dynamo to the uh, to the windmill and then when I did this I released the blades to start spinning. Once I released the blades and then the blades started spinning, uh, suddenly uh, the light um, came on. I connected the wire to the light bulb and then the light came on and then people started sharing and they say, yeah, he has really did it. Uh, he has done it and then. Everyone was happy. Uh, the kids were pushing each other to, to see. For me, I was also very happy at a particular uh, moment uh, because it was like I have proven to people that what I've been working on, it wasn't craziness. So now I have a light I can lead at night. So uh, after I did this, uh, my cousin gave me a car battery, which I was using to install power from the windmill. When the windmill is spinning, it was charging the car battery. Uh, because I had this car battery, I was able to uh, to add up four um, four more light bulbs. For when I add up four more light bulbs uh, on my system, I also had I also needed to to have some switches and wires to make the wiring of the house. Uh, but uh, because I didn't have any money to buy uh, to buy light uh, switches and proper wires for the wiring, what I did. I built my own um, my own light switch using uh, flip flap labbers and the uh, PVC pipes for the box of the switch. And the, inside the switch, there was uh, bicycle spokes. And when I was pushing up the button, uh, this one I built the um, uh, two gang switch. So I was like the top button; it was turning on. The bottom one it was turning off. So I was able to to control my lights turning off and turning on. And the other thing which I did, uh, because the wires that I used for wiring, it was just a bare wire. So I was afraid that if the wires could cross together, they can start fire. And because my house was made, my house roof was made out of grass, I was afraid that if such type of things happen, it will, uh, I will burn my house. So in order for me to prevent such kind of accident to happen, I decided to build my own socket breaker so that if the wires cross together, they can just break the current and no current flowing around. So the way I built this socket breaker, I used two nails and then I winded up uh, uh, insulator wires, copper wires on it, and the, I put I put a magnet in between in between two nails. So when the current is flowing around, the magnet in between was stable. But when there's short circuit, one end of the um, 
one end of the coiled nail was turned into a strong magnet, pulling the pulling the magnet in between. The other end was pushing that magnet towards the other other nail. In between there was a switch which I made out of a uh, ballpoint spring. And once um, once the the the, the uh, it go in that direction, it was just breaking the current. If there was something to happen, the current was breaking. So this is how I made the circuit breaker. And these two things, uh, the light switch with the flip-flop buttons and the spokes and the circuit breaker, it's the, that's a sp sp magnet from a stereo speaker. Um, these are on exhibit at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago right now. So, um, And wait, what did you use for tools? This is a good story. Yeah, uh, uh, for tools, when I was doing all this thing, I didn't have any, any tools to use. So I was just using anything I found uh, when I want to... Uh, like for hammer, I was just taking a big uh, a big spanner to, to to use for hammer. I I didn't have any uh, drawing machine, so if I want to draw some holes, I was heating up a nail, and then when he, the the nail get hot, and then I was able to run to a place where I want to draw some holes when I'm making the braids. But it was slow process because uh, when I'm heating it up. It gets really hot, and then the time I'm taking to the place where I want to draw some hole, it get it get uh, uh, it cools again, and then I was have to land back and forth. It was slow process. So you got all these things. What, what are people saying after the, you have all this stuff? What's happening? Yeah, after all this thing, now uh, people, lots of people started coming to charge their mobile phones. I could not get rid of them. <laughs> <laughs> Always people could come and ask me, you say that you are winning, you can charge your cell phone. I say, yes, you can charge your cell phone. They say, can I try it? I say, yes, you can try if you have a cell phone. And then once I plug in a cell phone and then it's showing that it is charging, I say, uh, your cell phone is charging. You see now that it is charging a cell phone. Uh, they say, yes, but I can't believe you. I'll believe you if my phone will be full charged. <laughs> So most of the time I was just uh, leaving them to charge the, the cell phone. How did you switch the, I mean, the, the, the generator produced AC power, I mean, how did you charge the battery? I mean, the, yeah, so, you, so for me, uh, when I'm trying to charge, the, uh, to charge the cell phone, I was using, I had, uh, I, I was using two ways. Uh, one way where, when I winded my own, uh, my own transformer, which was, I was using as a step-up transformer, because the dynamo generate uh, alternate current and then I was able to uh, to multiply the current and then connect to the cell phone charger I was able to charge but if I want to charge um, um, to charge a car battery I was just uh, connecting direct but I was using the direct to change the current from AC to DC current so that I can be able to charge the the battery where did you learn how to do that stuff all this stuff I was uh, I I learned them in the book the diagrams and the uh, pictures they say minus plus so I was just like trying to understand exactly how it works yeah did it work mm hmm <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh it wasn't uh, it wasn't only really people from the uh, uh from the surrounding uh, surrounding village who came. Also, the reporters came to, which led to bloggers, and the bloggers led to a call from something t called TED. I didn't know what TED was. Uh, TED is a, a, a conference, it's like a technology conference. TED stands for um, uh, Technology, Entertainment, and Design. So I was invited to attend the conference in Arusha, Tanzania. Uh, so when I when I had the I had the news that I've been invited to attend the conference in in Tanzania. There was a couple of things that comes to my mind. I was uh, I was afraid exactly what exactly am I going to wear to the conference, <laughs> and the other thing was about a uh, uh, plane. I have never seen an airplane, and I was like, what exactly am I going to face in the uh, in the plane? Uh, like enough people advised me. I don't know if it was good advice. They told me that if you are going to get the plane, uh, make sure that at particular day, don't eat. If you eat, you are going to vomit in the plane. <laughs> so I didn't eat anything. But I was surprised when I get into the plane, uh, finding that they were offering food. I was like, so... 
I was like, why are they offering food when they say that the people have vomit in the plane? <laughs> so uh, um, the other thing, I was also afraid. I had never slept in the hotel. I was like, what exactly am I going to face in the hotel? And I think you found cable television, right? You stay up st watching Super Sport all night or something. I stay up the whole night, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, 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 on the stage that day, I was too, uh, I was so nervous, um, everything, um, because everything was new, I, I, I remembered, I said, my English uh, disappeared in the, middle of, in the middle of speech. I remembered, I said one word, like, I tried and I made it. That's what I can remember now, so far from now. Um, for me, everything was new. Um, I remember someone asked me about the computer. If I know anything about computer, I have never used the computer. I say, uh, do you know? Uh, do you know the internet? I say, I don't know what the internet is. I say, do you know Google? I say, what animal is Google? I didn't know <laughs> what Google is. They say, uh, Google is where you can search any kind of information you want, and then you can be able to find. And I say, okay, let's try Google Windmills. I was interested to know what I'll find in the Windmills, and then I was surprised to see. Uh, millions and millions of the results of windmills. I was like, wow, where was this Google all this time? <laughs> could have so, used that, couldn't you? <laughs> I could, yeah, I could use it, but anyway, I still use the, mm. the book. Um, you can go on the TED website, TED.com, and you can, uh, you can watch William's first speech. And uh, the guy you're gonna, you see in that speech is very different from the guy you're going to meet today, and, or you're seeing today. He... Uh, you know, his English was, uh, he really was struggling with his English. He was nervous, as any of us would be nervous if we were speaking to five to six hundred people for the first time. And, and um, But the message that he, that he put out there really resonated with a lot of people. And there were some people in the audience, uh, some Americans, who were very moved by his story and felt that they didn't want him to go back uh, to this, this uh, situation of poverty in, in his village. So they, they w came up afterwards and they said, William, you know, what can we do to help you? And he was very clear, you know, he was like, well, yeah, if you want to help me, I want to go back to school, number one, and, and I also want to continue with my windmills because I want to pump water so my parents never have to go hungry again, and I want to do this in other villages as well. And so uh, with some help of some donations, uh, you know, they went back to Malawi, and you know, first thing you did was you put some new iron sheets on the roof of your house and in your family's houses, and now the rain didn't come through at night. You bought some mattresses for your parents and your sisters. They, you know, they were sleeping on blankets. Um, you sent them to the doctor for the first time. And um, you built this. Describe this to these engineering students. So. Yeah, I, I also uh, built uh, another window, a green machine. Um, uh, I call it a green machine because it is green. Um, <laughs> So uh, this machine, um, I think I, I know that maybe I'll be coming here. That's why I, I painted it green because also <laughs> that is so it's all about green. So uh, this this windmill uh, pumps water for my mom's uh, uh, vegetable garden. Uh, she used. We use that veg, uh, vegetable garden to some of which we eat, some of which uh, she sells at the market. So that's how this uh, windmills work. Yeah, the blades. What is from a from a an oil drum, right? Yeah. And um, so this pumps water from a shallow well that William's dad had dug some years back. But it's not clean water. It's not potable water. His mom just used this water for um, cl cleaning and stuff, um, and now for irrigation. But um, so before to get clean drinking water, uh, you know, William's mom uh, kind of went through the same routine that millions of African women go through, our people in the third world. She would wake up early in the morning and she would walk about a mile uh, to the nearest uh, pump that the government had dug some, some years back. And she would wait in line uh, with other women and, you know, pump her water in the, in the bucket and then, you know, drag them home one by one. And this whole process would take her about two hours every day. And, uh, you know, you add that, add that up in a year and it's amazing. I mean, there's so many, so much time that she could have, she could have used for other things. And before that, they were actually drinking water out of a marsh that was behind their house. And uh, you can imagine in the rainy season, it, it rinsed all this waste in there and it, they shared this water with cows and goats and some people got diarrhea and there was cholera was a problem in the, in the rainy season. So um, clean water is, is, is such an important thing in that village. So, um, you know, you guys went and you, you dug a well and 
it, it didn't cost that much money, you know, compared, I mean, uh, it relatively cheap. Um, but it was, it was a clean borehole, and uh, they were able to put about six taps around his village, and um, using uh, these solar pumps, a uh, solar powered pump, and uh, people from all over Williams Village now come and they use this water for free and it's the only clean drinking water um, for about 60 miles around. And so this is these tanks that you designed, right? You built that, you, you designed and built this structure? Yeah, I, I designed this structure so that I can be able to, uh, uh, to hold, the, each, uh, each one of the, these tanks is 5,000 liters, so uh, through the gravitation and then the water just flowing around from the pump pumps into the tanks and then through the gravitation, and it just goes around into the taps. And it's the first time any of these people had really seen, any of his family had ever seen, like, running water. It's, you know, kind of amazing. Um, and talk about this. You finally ad achieved something that you wanted to. Yeah, so uh, uh, through that system, we set up uh, a drip irrigation system. Now we can plant um, uh, crops um, two to three times a year, and my family no longer go hungry again because of the, the system, yeah. And of course, you created a soccer team too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah, we, uh, uh, I also started the soccer team. Um, what I noticed is that uh, there was a lot of uh, young people like me who drop out of school. When they drop out of school, they start doing some other uh, bad things, like start smoking up, uh, uh, marijuana and uh, some becoming alcoholic. So I was afraid that a uh, lot of uh, young people like me, they will be doing such type of things. In order to keep them busy with something else, I decided to start, to start a soccer team so that they can be spending their time uh, playing soccer. Um, you must have been pretty good at soccer, I mean, if you wanted a soccer team. Yeah, I, I, I was good on soccer, only to stay at the bench on the training. Yeah. <laughs> and then, wait. There you are, manager. Yeah. Um, the soccer team has actually had some really added benefit to the village. I mean, not only do these kids have something to do now, but um, it actually brought the community together because they're they're a regional club, and so they play guys from all around. And you know, every Saturday there's a big game at the village, and and that has started as you know several businesses. You know, these these women come and they sell uh, roasted maize or roasted peanuts, and it's these small little opportunities like this. Um, that really kind of paved the road out of poverty in a lot of places. It just it gives people a hand up rather than a hand out, and um, so it's 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 been nice to see this. And you can go to Williams Village, and he's got a lot of donations of jerseys and balls and cleats and stuff. And uh, so now he has a, a a youth league soccer club with the primary school students. So there's always a soccer game going on whenever you go to his village. It's pretty cool. And my favorite part of the story is William. You got to go back to school, and so. Um, Talk to me, these people, about where you go and what you do there and, and who, who your fellow classmates are. Yeah, so right now I'm back to school. Uh, I'm attending school in Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, the name of the school I'm going to is uh, African Leadership Academy, uh, which aims to transform future leaders of Africa. Uh, we are students from um, uh, 42 countries in Africa, all over the, con uh, all over the continent, yeah. And you know, this this school is filled with these young superheroes like William. They, they, they're from. None of them are there because their parents are rich or politicians or whatever. They're all there because of, on merit. And um, they're either like the, the smartest kids in their country who tested out on the on their on their exams. They got the best scores in their exams, or they had a similar uh, life experience as William. They grew up in poverty and had tried some way to benefit their their community or their family. Uh, you know, there's young entrepreneurs in, these, in, in this school like William. Um, and and uh, yeah, I mean, so I think we're gonna see a lot from these students at ALA and not just from William, but from these other guys as well. And um, William has since started a nonprofit uh, organization called the Moving Windmills Project. And a lot of these things that we've been talking about, the water well and the soccer club, um, they go through this this um, this nonprofit, and so if you go on movingwindmills.org, you can kind of you can find out out about it, and um, it also is going to fund a uh, a project that he hopes to complete in the next couple of years, which is to rebuild his primary school in his village using green sustainable technologies. And right now, the school is in 
horrible shape. It was built in the 50s for about, by the Catholic Church for about 400 students, and there's about 1,500 students in there now, and 2,000 when he was going there. And there's no roof in a lot of the building. Um, there's no desks, there's no books for the kids. I think, what, four students share a book or something like that? Yeah. And um, during the kind of lean, hungry seasons between the harvest, uh, the kids drop out because there's no breakfast. And it's amazing how just a breakfast can keep students in school and, and uh, increase retention rates. And, um, and so he's going to be working with, he wants to work with the World Food Program. They're already there at the school to provide free breakfast for these kids and stuff. So that's another thing that this uh, this uh, pro this um, Moving Windmills project is working towards. And it's also, part of it is going to fund this documentary film that's being made. And um, we're going to show you a clip of that, and then we'll do some Q&A, and then we'll go sign books. So um, we'll roll them. <laughs> Is it up there? The light. Anybody have any questions? Can I answer them? Yeah. 
well. You had welding access to welding equipment. I was impressed with that. Why you had, not? You had welding equipment? Welding? Yeah, did you have access to welding equipment? Um, yeah, there was a, a, a shop where most of the time I was using to um, uh, to, 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 uh, to give the welder to, to do my work. But most of the time when I was doing that, sometimes uh, they were just laughing at me when I'm doing it. So sometimes I was trying to do it by myself. <laughs> you, you would bring this thing and you'd say, please weld my shock absorber to the sprocket of the bicycle. <laughs> and he was like, what? You know. Um, anybody? Yeah. So what's the state of the what what are the, what's the state of your windmills now? What's going on? Yeah, uh, uh, my windmills are still working right now. So far from uh, this time I started, uh, so far I've built uh, six windmills, uh, but currently there are uh, three windmills that are working right now. And those are both pumping water in? generating electricity for the house. He's got solar panels on, on the roofs of his family's house, small solar panels, and it works on a hybrid system. So it's, it's solar and, and um, solar and wind power, so. Um. Uh, for your first one, well, how many people did you have? How did you get the actual structure constructed? You must have had people helping you, I imagine. Yeah, uh, I had um, uh, my cousin, uh, Geoffrey, who was uh, helping me when I was building the, the tower because I couldn't do it uh, by myself or lifting up the windmill up to the top. It was a really hard time. And also uh, one of my best friends, Gilbert, also helped me. Yeah. They actually got a, a wire clothesline and used it like a pulley and they hoisted the, the thing up. and It seemed difficult. <laughs> um, <laughs> How long did you spend over there uh, working on the book? Yeah, um, yeah, I spent about three or four months, well, three and a half months. We worked on the book uh, on his school holidays, the only time we really had to work. So, I mean, on the ground, all the times we were on the phone. So I spent, I lived with his family for about three, to, three and a half, four months. And uh, his mom took care of me and, you know, answered all my millions and millions of questions. and. Um, yeah, we really focused on, on that famine. It was a, it's a big part of the book. And then um, the science, I think, was probably the, the other really difficult because William and I, William's English wasn't as good as it is now, so he spoke Chichewa, his, his first language, when we did the book. We spoke through a translator so he could be comfortable speaking his first language and I could, I could really get the rhythms of his voice and, the, and the, get his sense of humor. Cause he's a pretty funny guy in Chichewa. And you're, you're becoming a funny guy in English, but... Um, <laughs> And, I mean, you made John Stewart laugh, man. I mean, it's difficult to to, to make joke in a foreign language. Yeah, yeah, I know. You're, <laughs> you're, you're getting good at it, though. Um, yeah. So yeah, you know, I was able to hear the way he spoke in Chichewa, and you know, he's a very florid speaker, and, and uh, I, you know, I was able to mine the kind of essential elements of his speech and give him an English voice because he didn't really have an English voice then. So, um, and uh, so it was really fun. You know, to, to to write this book, and I'd be, I'd been a, you know reporter. I've been a reporter in Congo for the past five years, and and had been reporting on a war that's killed five million people in, in the past ten years. So you can imagine the stories that I was working on. You know, I reported rapes and massacres, and um, and and uh, so to see this story of this young guy in Malawi who's didn't wait on the government to do anything this for him, didn't wait on aid workers to come and do it for him. Um, and didn't wait on you know guys like me, Western journalists, to come and recognize him. And you know, um, it was really inspiring to me. And it was a, it was a story I've been looking to tell for a really long time. Um, it, was, it was finally a, a really positive story out of Africa because Africans always ask me, why do you always report these bad stories? You want to never report our good stories. And it was a question that I thought was very valid. Um, and it was a great question, but I never really had a great answer for it. Um, we were always really too busy reporting the you know the the, the war because the war was so in our face and it was all consuming and and so I was able to I was really really uh, inspired uh, that I could go to another country and I could find that these these things do exist and so um, uh, if there's a guy like William in Malawi 
and uh, how, how many guys exist like him throughout Africa. So I think if we really work toward putting resources and, and attention and finding guys like this, I'm speaking as journalists and as, you know, as aid workers, whoever, I think that's kind of the real answer to lift Africa up. It's, William has a, is, is, his motto is, you know, African solutions for African problems. And uh, I think he really embodies that. And so um, I'm really encouraged to see what he's going to do in, in, in the future. So anybody else? Up there. Yeah. So what are your plans after school? What are your plans after school? Uh, uh after school, uh, after college, uh, I uh, am planning to uh, uh, go back to my country and then uh, starting uh, working on um, uh, implementing uh, the ideas that I will be uh, studying at the school. So mostly I want to be working towards uh, uh, low cost uh, uh, renewable energy and also I also want to try how I can help in bringing um, clean water to the uh, rural areas in my country. Yeah. What if somebody said, William, you know, you just graduated from college, you know, why don't we give you a nice apartment in Boston and a couple hundred thousand dollars, a nice car, swimming pool? Swimming pool? A swimming pool. Yeah. It is cold. I can't swim in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you seen the lake in Malawi? <laughs> you wouldn't stay? Uh, 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 um, uh, if somebody can say that, uh, I prefer to go uh, to go home because I feel like uh, there's a lot of things that needed to, to also to be done there. So if uh, all of us uh, will be leaving our country, who is going to, to do things? So, yeah. There was a question that I had. Yeah, I was going to ask, does anyone... Um, has anybody else tried to copy you, build another windmill? Yeah, uh, yeah. There's a guy who uh, uh, who built his uh, his own uh, windmill, but he haven't yet uh, put the generator so that he can start generating electricity. But he have already uh, built it. And the other thing that I'm planning to do um, uh, on during the break time, I want to go there and then teach at least 10 or 15 young people in my area, and then they'll be teaching others so that I can build up the network of how to build the windmill and the other thing that I know. Um, just kind of a quick question, so did, did you answer it? Could you talk about like, how important it is to have like, a good quality of water supply in your country? Because I think that you know, there's a lot of issues with water supply in the United States, and there's a lot of issues Well, I mean, I would say that electricity is a, is the first step in, in in doing. I mean, I don't know. What what do you think? Uh, why 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 is electricity important when people are hungry? Uh, uh, for me, I was hoping that uh, uh, that uh, electricity can be used in many uh, in many ways. Uh, it can be used to uh, to pump water, and then uh, for me, for my situation, I was hoping that if I can be able to pump water, because I know the root cause of the or the hunger that we are experiencing, it was due to drought. Because of the drought, the crops didn't do well. So I was trying to find the ways that are going to be uh, supplying water to the crops when such type of things happen. So for me, it was kind of uh, a solution to my, the problem that I was facing at a particular time. Yeah, I know, I'll clarify. I mean, he set out to build a water pump first. I mean, that was, I mean, he, it wasn't like he said to his dad one day, like, we're going to go live off the grid. You know, it was just, it was like, I want to pump water so I never have to see my family starve again. You know, it was a traumatic, it was like a response to trauma, essentially. Um, and, um, but he didn't have, you know, he set out to build that water pump first, but didn't have the materials, couldn't find the materials for the water pump. So, um, made the, electri the electricity producing one, one instead because that's the materials that he was able to find. But eventually he was able to pump water and stuff. I mean, so the pumping water was, was, the, was the eventual goal, you know. Um, electricity, 
as you know was important, but um, the, the water pump was to irrigate crops. Yeah, first. Yeah. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, how strong is the wind, and then how much uh, power were you getting uh, in terms of you know, RPMs, whatever? I mean, how is it? How are you able to put together as far as you know, the wind availability, and how consistent is it? How, how strong um, is the wind there? Yeah, uh, in my yeah, um, in my area, it's almost uh, windy press and. Um, uh, it's, I haven't yet measured in terms of the speed of the wind, but I guess it's up to uh, 15, uh, 15 uh, kilometers per, uh, per hour. It reach up such such level sometimes. So um, the windmill was able to generate uh, uh, the bicycle dynamos designed to generate 12 volts uh, when somebody is riding a bicycle. But the speed of the or the windmill was more faster than the the bicycle of somebody uh, doing actual riding bicycle. So it was over than um, other than twelve. But I was just taking as an average of twelve volts that he was able to generate. It was enough to charge a car battery so that I can be using the car battery. Yeah. And now he has a deep cycle battery system and inverters and all kinds of stuff. So pretty fancy. Um, but not, but not too complicated. I mean, you know, you have inverters and you have these batteries in all the houses, right? I mean, so yeah. with, the, with the solar panels on the roof. Um, anyone else? First, thank you so much for coming. Um, I have two-part questions. Um, one is, um, how do you find out about drip irrigation as a method for water? And um, how is it? How did you find out about drip irrigation and how has it affected the, the crops, the uh, crop production? Um, uh, drip irrigation, uh, uh, it's a good way of uh, irrigating uh, crops, uh, especially when you have a uh, uh, limited amount of water. So it's just uh, drip the water exactly where the crop is. So if you don't have enough water, it's a good way of doing irrigation. Um, for It has been... Uh, benefiting because it has been uh, doubling the amount of uh, maize that we harvest in a, at a year because we planted three times a three times a year we use the same uh, the same press when the uh, the rain uh, using the rain season and then when the rain is over and then we can plant again and then we can harvest the same amount that we harvested when the rain was raining while before we are just like the one that you have harvested when the uh, the rain was raining, it was only the same one until then another rain would start. So it has tripled the yeah. uh, product. Yeah. I think you guys found out about it on your first trip to the U.S. You read about this. It's called Shape in Living Waters. It's a yeah. this guy invented the drip irrigation system, and it's it's a really easily assembled you know kit that you. I mean, we we put it together in his field. It was like. Took us half a day, but um, just connect hoses together. It's pretty cool. So, um, how did your new education affect your life and your goal to improve the lives of your people in your village? How, how did your con con continuing education? Or, yeah. Oh yeah. How has ALA uh, affected your goals? I mean, uh, um, um, my. Um, uh, Elias uh, 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 affected uh, my goals in a positive way uh, because uh, when, before I started uh, studying there, I was just like uh, hoping that um, uh, when uh, when I finish uh, I finish school, maybe I will start this uh, this uh, this program building the wind music. But uh, once I started studying at the area, I. I started looking at uh, different things in the different angles that like uh, what exactly needed to be uh, to be done through support from learning with the, some other other student from all over the, uh, the, the, the continent I'm able to understand uh, what life is like in other parts of Africa and uh, what people are, are, are facing in everyday life and also uh, at school, we were also studying um, entrepreneurship, so I'm kind of like learning in both both angles. I was just hoping that maybe uh, I'll be only learning science or become uh, I'll become um, engineering. I'll learn engineer. So now it's like it's, 
it has just changed me the way I think in different things, yeah. All right, we're, we're going to actually got to head up and sign books, so thank you.